we'll be talking about below the surface. Uh, and gosh, let's just get started, shall we? All right, does anyone know what this is? Hmm? Very good. That is sugar. Somebody is some crazy kind of nerd back there. All right. <laughs> Incidentally, this is not what I'm going to be talking about today. There's a lot of sugar in YUI3, and uh, there's more sugar being landed. In 3.3, Matt talked about a, li a little bit about that last night uh, at, the, at the show and tell. And, of course, there's more fantastic sugar being added in and all sorts of functionality and features uh, being added in the gallery every day. And uh, that's your job, too, by the way. Yeah, so. um, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about. I'm actually going to be talking more about this not specifically this, but more of the architectural pieces and those uh, key architectural decisions that we made to build up the structure and um, create the foundation for YUI, the library, and uh, some of the decisions we made, a little, little bit of history and uh, detail about that, so I'll give you a little more understanding. So uh, what I want to cover is the genesis of the module system that is at the heart of YUI 3 and then <laughs> explore the DOM abstraction layer that we have that you all know and love as Node, and uh, maybe give you a couple of different ways that you can play in that abstraction space that maybe you weren't familiar with already. So, so it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster ride. <laughs> so <laughs> hang on to your butts and let's get started. So how many of you came to YUI3 and were like, um, what now? Yeah. Yeah, this is a pretty new idiom. It's not something that you see in any other library. It is, um, it's new uh, to YUI and sort of new to the JavaScript library space. If you look at the construct, it's actually not that complicated, right? What you're doing is you're calling a function and then calling a function on the return value of that function, right? I mean, that's not super complicated JavaScript or anything like that. It's when you start throwing things in the parentheses and adding functions in there, it's a little mind-bending, and then putting that in contrast with uh, coming from a different library or just your own code where everything is just in line and it, it's fairly simple and it makes sense. But we'll dive into here, I'll explain that a little bit. So a little context. Um, JavaScript needs modules. Anybody here have not heard that before? All right, so JavaScript needs modules is not just me saying that. It's not just the YUI team saying that. It's actually uh, a lot of very important people are saying that, including... Uh, TC39, we're talking about, uh, they have the discussion going on right now. This is the current uh, straw man for the definition of modules as part of the language. This is planned to uh, go into, well, it's working for, it's in Harmony, right? It's in discussion for Harmony for the next upcoming version of ECMAScript. So it's not really a question at this point of whether or not modules are a good idea. They should, you know, whether or not they should be added to the language. The question is really how. And the reason is that they make sense for our environment. They make sense that this is the next step for how to code against the language. And um, so one of the reasons for that is this little guy. So as we are developing more complex applications as time goes by, we have a lot more needs from the system that we're working with. And what we have to work with today is fairly inadequate, right? So the script tag is the, uh, by definition, it's the, the, the specified way, the preferred way to get script onto your page, right? There are a lot of different me uh, mechanisms for doing that. They range anywhere from clever to, I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. But script is there, it's in the spec, it's really just the primary mechanism for getting script onto your page. <laughs> so what it does, though, is that it's responsible for both loading and executing the script. One thing is loading and executing the script. It's synchronous by default. If you were here, by, if you were here for Nicholas's talk yesterday, you saw him describing all of the various incarnations using async attribute and defer attribute, um, but, and seeing how injecting a script in your page can really impact performance. But without those attributes, which are incidentally, as he mentioned, uh, not cross-browser compatible, There's, uh, they're implemented slightly differently, or they're just not implemented in some browsers. <laughs> um, so that's, right now, that's an imperfect science. And then the, uh, the shared global context of this, that we're used to including a script on the page, and the content inside of that script 
has access to everything on the page. There is no security built in whatsoever. We just don't have that today. And finally, well not really finally actually, just another point uh, about where script starts breaking down is that the script is ignorant of the system that it's in. If you're building an application that's made of all of these different components and it's built up from this, this set of components, one script has no knowledge of its relationship to another script. The content inside of that script may have some functional binding from one to the other, but this script has to be there in order for that one to run properly, right? But none of that information is described for you, or there's no mechanism for you describing that in the script tag itself, right? This is just a tag to put something on the page. So the bottom line is that it's really an inadequate control for us as we're developing more complex applications. We need more granular control of when things are loaded, when things are executed, and the control of where things are being run, and more control over the environment that we actually are working in. And modules can help with that. Uh, <clears throat> are they the solution? You know, maybe not, not the complete solution. Uh, as I said, they are the logical next step forward for coding in the language. They're a huge step forward in terms of coding practices and how we, the, the patterns that we're familiar with coding in uh, JavaScript and what JavaScript looks like when we, when we write it. So <clears throat> the module pattern, right? So let's take a look at the module pattern. The, the first documented history that I'm aware of the module pattern was on Complang JavaScript, the Google group, uh, back in 2003. And it was a really fascinating discussion, actually. Uh, if you can, it's not difficult, actually, to find this. You can reference the name. Um, and what that does, it was talking about closures in JavaScript and exploring that space a little bit, right? Now, in 2007, Eric wrote this article here that was describing this pattern, or at least naming the pattern, right? It wasn't, there's nothing new about this. It's just the application of it and describing one implementation of using closures to afford some access controls and some, some level of security on the code that we're actually implementing on the page, right? And <clears throat> it was... Uh, well, let me, let me just run through it real quick. So the, the primary thing that you see happening is that we have a function that returns an object. And we're executing that function immediately. Right? The trailing parents here, we're executing that function. And the object that we're building up here gets returned and it gets stored in that variable up there, which we call API. Right? So it happens to be that we're returning an object with these methods, with these properties, and so it looks like an instance of something. Alternately, you know, you could, you could generate a class in here and then return that function with its prototype. And, and the things that you build inside of that function, because JavaScript is function scoped, um, that's Vegas in here, baby. I mean, you can do anything you want in there. And what's happening outside, they don't see that. They, don't, they only get to see what you tell them. So uh, all of these private things in there are only as visible as we expose that level of visibility, right? So it's a, it's a huge thing. And talking about new stuff, right? When that article came out, it got <laughs> read by thousands and thousands of people, and these developers were like, hot damn, this is really cool. I had no idea JavaScript could do this. It's been able to do it forever, but the coding paradigms that we had at the time and the patterns that we followed at the time, this was very foreign. And so like any new tool, you know, this, this shiny hammer, everything started to look like a nail. And before long, we started to see, okay, this particular implementation of what we're calling the module pattern, this has its weaknesses. It can get kind of awkward at times. And uh, it can cause trouble in certain circumstances where it gives us benefits in other circumstances, right? So we need to actually think about that. But the real value, I guess the two values that, that came out of that article were that one, it gave the pattern a name, or it introduced the idea, the other idea, the other main thing was that it, that it introduced the idea of using closures. And so it, it uh, was very educational in broadcasting that this language is incredibly flexible. You can use these functions and do amazing things with them that have been there all the time. Maybe you just weren't, weren't aware. So we started making all sorts of different things using closures, all sorts of different variations like that, 
We like recognizing that uh, variables scoped inside of a function can be compressed better, right? We, we have some assurance that we're not going to do any damage to the system when we compress variables or function names that are defined inside of another function. We have more control of that, so we can have our minifiers munge things down and we can create a smaller download package, right? All of you are familiar with that. Um, <clears throat> we can do some protection of things, like uh, in this case here, an unfortunate uh, um, quality of the language is that you can actually assign a new value to undefined, which is fixed in strict mode, by the way. Um, but in here, for example, since you know, I'm, I'm not passing in a third argument, the default value is undefined, but the true undefined, not the undefined as as it was assigned up there. So you can use those sorts of pattern. Um, another one is uh, duck punching, so inline redefinition of a, of a method on an object. So in this case here, I'm taking an object method, and I'm passing it, the object method, into this wrapping function, referencing it as the original, and then I'm redefining that object method, having access to the original definition inside of that. Um, this is actually, you know, this, this is effectively a destructive pattern. You can't undo that. But um, the, just an illustration of some clever things that you can do with closures and how developers were now introduced to this concept of using functions, using closures to, to expand and be creative with um, the things that you can do with JavaScript. So it was really a fantastic time where there's suddenly this new um, spark of innovation and so we started making all sorts of really clever and really creative and, and occasionally really, really awful things. So here's what we did with it. Not speaking of awful things, incidentally. Here's what we did with the, the module pattern as it was originally. Um, there are two things that I want to point out here. So I, most of you are probably familiar with this, with this construct here, the YUI add statement. If you've ever, ever built anything with YUI 3, chances are you've been authoring your own modules. And um, this is what it looks like. But two things I want to point out. <laughs> One is that instead of having that function return the API, or if you remember the, the original illustration of the module pattern, the API was an object that was returned. Instead of just having that be some free assignment that happens outside of this function, we're saying, no, no, you put that here. I'm going to pass in an object into that function, and this is the destination. Instead of saying, the destination is out that door, we don't know if there's you know, anybody out there, or brigands, or you know, some party going on out there. But, so we say, here is where you put it. And then <clears throat> the second thing that we do, oh, and the, so here's where you put it. Right? You can see the API is being built up there on that object. And the second thing that we do is we don't execute that function. right? So originally in the module pattern, you have this wrapping function, and it encapsulates this, this set of functionality, defines this API, and it executes, right? So it's basically a factory that gets built, builds something, and then falls down. So in this case here, we have this factory that's built up, and instead of letting it execute immediately and then fall down, we say, we're going to keep you around for a little while. Please and thank you very much. We're going to give you this name right here, and we're going to actually register this uh, encapsulation of functionality in a, a module registry system. So YUI is that module registry, this global YUI. Notice there's no parentheses there. So it's this global module registry system that we're storing this function reference to and we're assigning it a name, saying, all right, now <clears throat> when you ask for this, when you ask for my awesome module, this is what you mean. And what that does is it then decouples the execution of that encapsulated logic from the loading of that logic, right? So back in the world of script tags here, we have my dependency here and my awesome module there. If, there, it, if the uh, logic is not being executed, it doesn't matter what order they're in in the source, right? So you can have all of your script tags being you know, moved around however you want. You don't have to worry about things falling apart. But it isn't terribly useful unless you execute it, right? But again, decoupling the execution from the, um, from the registration of that, now we give you the mechanism to say, all right, so I happen to load these things out of order, but I want to execute them in a particular order. So rather than the script tag loading and executing 
and giving you very little control to no control over the actual order of things, having the system that says register here and execute here gives you that, gives you that control. So let's talk about YUI a little bit more, <laughs> because we are at YUI Conf, I guess. So YUI <coughs> is that module registry system like I was talking about. And it's also a sandbox factory. So when you see it being executed, it's creating this, this object that we know as Y. And, uh, and we'll talk about the application of that sandbox. It's also, uh, Yui is also a Japanese singer. <laughs> which is really unfortunate for following us on Twitter um, or searching for us in general. We're going to stick, actually, with these two. Uh, I don't want to talk about her anymore. She is very talented, though, I guess. So <clears throat> why, on the other hand, talked about why UI there. Now the why, this, this generated object here, what it is is the execution controller of those modules. So it is the, the thing that says, now it's time to run this module. And it's also the, the sandbox, uh, the generated sandbox from there. We'll talk about the application of the sandbox in a second. And it's also the host of where those APIs are going. So there's a lot actually going on in this Y. But the key thing, actually, I think, is that first one. And that is, this is the, this is the control that says it's time to execute this logic. So executing the modules, we'll look here at the second line here. Uh, hopefully all of you saw uh, Ryan's excellent talk on autocomplete yesterday. Um, <clears throat> but what we have going on here is we're generating this Y. Now, regardless of what happened in the order for loading these modules uh, in, this, you know, the, in the source or in script or whatever, at this point I say, now it's time to run. And at, beyond that point, we now have an API to speak of. This actually has uh, some requirement for synchronicity of the loading of things, but I'll talk about that later. So the YUI sandbox, um, this isn't a very good illustration of sandboxing because we are creating that Y globally and it's just out there for everyone to see. So all of the APIs that get generated and all of the logic that's going on with that Y that's just out there. So we'll replace this pattern actually with this pattern and now this is starting to look more familiar, right? So we have the YUI being executed generating that Y and <clears throat> Then the use method, which is responsible for executing these modules, now takes an additional parameter that says, all right, when I'm done with that, then run this stuff. Right? And so now inside of here, inside of this function, we're passing in that sandbox where, again, Vegas. Right? Outside of there, they have no visibility of what's going on inside of here. So we actually have some true sense of sandboxing. And finally, Y is where the APIs are, right? So we have step one and step two, the registration system separated from the execution system. But they share this Y, right? This Y is actually passing through the system like that. And we'll walk through that a bit. So here we have a very typical use line. Well, it will be typical when people start using autocomplete, which I highly encourage because it's pretty awesome. Um, <clears throat> so Y UI executes, generates that Y. The registry system recognizes autocomplete is associated with the logic that was registered in this file. So it says, in my, in my hash, I have the name autocomplete associated with this factory method, right? And so the Y then passes through the use statement down to that, that function, the uh, factory method in that module definition, passes through that logic in there where the Y is then decorated with the API, and finally passes back up to the use line where it continues on and continues on through the other modules that you're using, and finally ends up in that use function <coughs> where the API is guaranteed to exist at this point, right? And there's where you use it. So <coughs> revisiting where we're coming from here, so coming from the script world into the module world, the loading and the execution is now decoupled, right? So that, that problem is addressed by using, this, uh, using a module system, a module registry and execution system. The synchronicity, it doesn't really have to be synchronous, right? But the key thing is the execution having been decoupled, <clears throat> we have control of when things are being executed. So if we load things asynchronously or we load things synchronously or through whatever other mechanism, it doesn't really matter because what they're doing is just loading to register. And we have the control over when things are executed. 
the shared global context goes away because now we have that use construct where we're using the, the function wrapper over the implementation code that receives that API and because of function scoping inside of that uh, callback, you have a protected environment as well as a protected API. So instead of building up modules onto some global thing where potentially a third party script could access the APIs that your implementation code are using, now the API code as well is also secure, right? Now the only thing left is the ignorant of the system part, but just add meta, right? If we're registering a function as the sort of factory method to describe and encapsulate the set of functionality, then <clears throat> we can actually include some metadata that further describes in the registry system its relationship to other pieces in the system, right? So here we have a set of requirements or maybe there's some optional features that can be added in. Maybe it's associated with some CSS resources or some other external resources and it's skinnable or what have you. We, we have a space now to actually describe this logic in the context of a larger system. So that takes care of that and now where we are is uh, loading decoupled from execution, right? We have modules that can be loaded out of order, doesn't matter. <clears throat> and all of those other things that I just fast forwarded right through. But that's just the beginning, right? So now we have an abstraction over an inadequate system. We can do all sorts of cool stuff with an abstraction boy. So let's do some of those things. We'll load modules on demand now, right? So we've been assuming that the scripts are on the page doing nothing but registering in the system. So let's now take the execution step and make the execution step smarter. Let's hook that execution step into a loading mechanism that says, all right, you asked for, uh, <clears throat> you asked for DD. Well, I'm going to go and get it for you now instead of having the requirement that you know, the, the page was set up to have DD on it before that the, the use statement was executed, right? So we'll go ahead and load that stuff on demand. And that gives us the power also to then say, at some point later on in my application logic, my implementation logic, well, let's do that again. Let's load in DD now that I have some hint that it will actually be useful to the implementation instead of front loading all of the logic that might be relevant to this page, right? So conditional logic or conditional loading just built right in, right? And while we're at it, let's resolve some dependencies as well. So instead of saying my dependencies in my awesome module, you know, if you have a metadata system that, that relates those things together, then have the loader and have the use mechanism in, intelligent enough to make sure that those things are, are executed in the order that they need to be. And if you didn't ask for one, we know that it needs this. So let's, ex let's execute that one as well and make sure that it's loaded, execute that one as well, and make sure that that all happens. So we resolve dependencies. Uh, we can avoid duplication. So if we have one module that's related to X, Y, and Z, another module that's related to A, B, and X, we don't have to load X twice because we know as we're requesting to, to use this functionality or to build up our application with these modules that we already have X. So we can go and get A and B and we don't need to get X or as we're exploding out these dependencies to say this is the full suite of things that we need, we don't need to get X twice. We also don't need to run X again if uh, later on in the system by some conditional, uh, conditional loading or conditional use, uh, we say I want to add DD. Well, DD has these dependencies. We're not going to execute those dependencies. We're already satisfied. So avoiding duplication, we can combine requests, so using combo services if they're available to minimize HTTP, uh, HTTP requests. So a platform for us to inject best practices in the simple API. Under the hood, just wire it in there and it just works, right? Leveraging the CDN, another example. And a new thing that is also very exciting is that the metadata can actually describe its relationship to a particular test of an environment, right? So you can take your seed file, for example, and say, I want to use these things. And the seed file can say, before I go and fetch those things, let me get a little bit more knowledge about the environment that I'm actually working in. Oh, I'm not working in IE? Oh, great, I'm not going to load any of that code then, right? So at this point, the modules, as you write them, as you are defined, can assume the, um, can assume, 
satisfactory uh, compliance with, with a particular API, right? So you don't have to write IE forking or Opera forking and that sort of thing in your implementation code, in your module code, because we have a metadata system that says, if I'm in an environment that needs these things, then I can load this additional module that then handles that forking for me, or it just redefines this method to operate as it needs to given this environment, right? So that frees you up tremendously to just write code that, uh, that works for a particular environment and is optimized to work in that environment and, again, reduces the overall download size because you're not, you're not loading the, the crufting fork, which by definition is going to be cruft anywhere you are, right? And there's, there's a bunch more stuff, right? You get the point. But the, 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 uh, the overall story here is that since we have this abstraction layer, that abstraction layer and those objects that are in that abstraction layer are in our control. And that affords us a great deal of opportunity to, to enhance, that, uh, enhance that interaction. So we take a, an example of the old and busted, the world that we were in before, where we happen to have you know, a script out of order, we've got some conditional loading going on there. We just say, no, I, I just want to use this, this API. And we can. That's it. And so the, the use of a, uh, of a module system does that for you. And you know, incidentally, it also works for CSS. It works in Node.js. It works in YQL. Because the module system as an infrastructure is not necessarily tied to a script tag. right? If we have that in our control, then we say, all this logic does is it registers an API, right? The mechanism for fetching those things can be decoupled from this. And now, if I get loaded into Node, OK, I get loaded into Node. I'm getting loaded into Node by an import statement or by a require statement or something like that. You don't have to care about that anymore. Your modules just work in the environment that you're in because the plumbing is flexible like that. And we actually have control over that, that loading mechanism. So that's, uh, <clears throat> that's the breakdown that I wanted to give over the uh, why UI and a little bit of time spent on the, um, the module infrastructure. Hopefully you have a better understanding of it or some of the justification behind that. And uh, we'll take a little breather. <laughs> and uh, now we'll just get back to it, actually. So part two, we'll talk about the node abstraction and the DOM abstraction. A little bit here. Uh, if you were in Nate's talk this morning or yesterday afternoon, morning, yesterday, yesterday at some point, time is all a blur. Um, he mentioned that the DOM level three spec was a candidate recommendation in 2004. Do you remember 2004? I mean, IE was three years old. There was no IE seven. Firefox wasn't even version one yet. Right? We're talking. You know, IE is 98 percent of the browser share, or browser market, right? And of course, Opera was, was there. Um, <clears throat> but that spec is actually, now today, it's fairly well understood. It hasn't versioned at all, and it hasn't really been in flux. It's really just a question of implementing it and implementing it well, which ends up being the problem, of course, um, <clears throat> because there are so many implementations of it that it ends up getting implemented incorrectly or incompletely by any variety of different user agents that we have, right? But they're actually pretty close, right? I mean, we're, talking, we're not really talking 80-20 at this point. We're talking more like 95-5, right? They, they all generally agree on the APIs. They get the stuff right. We've been hounding them for years. They're, you're broken in this particular way. You're off spec in this particular way. So they're responsive, right? They're, they're, they're responsive developers. They're going to fix their stuff unless they're IE, but the, which is not true, actually. IE9 is doing a fantastic job. Uh, but um, that's, now I'm talking about desktop, uh, desktop browsers. But now, all of a sudden, insert mobile, and we've just jumped back a few years in the capacity of the DOM and the implementation quality of the DOM and the APIs that we're working with. And this sucks again, all of a sudden. It's like. We're supposed to be moving forward, aren't we? I mean, it feels like we're moving back now, and this is really uncomfortable. So we need normalization, right? It feels like maybe we don't need normalization. The browsers are fixing these things, or we just have a really good, clear understanding of the, uh, of the areas where the DOM starts getting a little wonky from browser to browser, you know, whatever. So 
it turns out that we cannot forecast what horribleness will be coming around the corner in a couple of years, right? That mobile being absolute crap should have been foreseen, right? It, but it really wasn't expected. It somehow hit us like a ton of bricks. We're like, oh my God, this is terrible. And it's not like it was just around the corner. I mean, it's been there coming at us all of, you know, over time. But the, the, the moral of the story anyway is that we need a normalization layer in order to handle these things, right? So we need a system that is based on providing an API that developers can, can have some sense of, uh, of security coding against this API and not having to worry about the particular implementation that next year when a new implementation comes on the market is falling over in completely unexpected ways, right? So in YEY2, um, <clears throat> we provided these methods uh, via a set of utilities. And <clears throat> that, was, uh, that was all fine and dandy. And it's nice to actually have that mechanism for you know, just, just reference these methods. And if there's something that needs to happen that's weird from browser to browser, the, the library developers are actually full time on this. This is what they do. This is what they care about. So an employer can tell the employee or the, the web dev, I want you to build this. They don't, tell the, uh, they don't tell the web dev, I want you to build this and in IE when it does this and that, you know, do something else or make sure that you're covering these things. As a web developer, the important part is the application that you're building. So your concerns should live in that, in that problem space, defining the application and building out the application that you're actually working on. The nuances of how the various browsers fall apart or the implementations start getting all wonky, that is more than a full-time job. I know because I have one of them. So <clears throat> um, in YUI2 world, we have the browser DOM, and then we have that set of utilities there that hook into there, and then the implementation code, of course, was written on top of, uh, written directly against the browser DOM and occasionally would use the um, utility methods to fix stuff, right? So the problem there, of course, is developers need to know that there's a problem, right? And not only do developers need to know that there's a problem, but they <coughs> um, need to be able to forecast that there may be a problem. But like I said, knowing when to fork off is a full-time job because we're actually doing this every day and we're discovering new ways and little idiosyncrasies where the browsers are falling apart regularly. Right? You can't be expected to do that. And we really appreciate when you find it and you tell us because we, we're busy trying to do that every day anyway. So we need your help on that as well. But the problem there is that if you're a developer that knows all of these things, knows how to make all of these decisions, then doesn't that make you a library developer? I mean, really? I mean, you should be helping us build this stuff. This is great. But that's a, that's a really high expectation of, of a web developer to not only be familiar with the problem space that they're working in, but also be familiar with all of the idiosyncrasies that any given implementation and being able to code in a way that forecasts broken implementations in the future, right? So YUI3's take on this, still normalization by utility. Maybe you weren't aware actually that we do have this set of functions uh, as utility functions, utility methods, very much like uh, Yahoo Util DOM, <coughs> and the other utility methods in YUI2, there's a y.dom namespace that has all of these methods in there. It's a set of utilities. But now, we provide an abstraction layer over the top of that that is responsible for making those decisions for you. And um, while giving you affordance to take the path that you want to, right? We don't want to just make all of the decisions for you, but the, the point being, that uh, instead of having to branch off into direct DOM or over to a utility, we provide you an API. And that affords the ability to um, <clears throat> code against this node API. And the implementation actually ends up being a lot easier because there are fewer code comments explaining why I'm doing this or where things are getting all confusing. And uh, it allows you actually to be more effective and just code more and more faster and, and more better in other, other aberrations of the English language. So 
again, so it, revisiting the, the notion of having an abstraction over an inadequate system, now we have a place to add some hooks, right? So <laughs> taking stock of what we have right now, before we start going, uh, going crazy with some of the sugar that we can add on top of this abstraction layer, this is what we start with, right? We have the capacity to load and execute asynchronously or have more finite control over the loading mechanism and the execution mechanism. We have the capacity to say, given a particular environment, this is the optimal set of code to execute. These are the sets of concerns that are applicable to this particular environment, uh, where the DOM falls down in this particular environment, right? We have the utility layer to provide, um, to, to address those variances, and then we provide this abstraction layer that, provide, that gives this unified API uh, to reference the utility methods when necessary, and then hit the DOM directly when it's not necessary, right? So getting the, bo the best of both worlds, hitting the performance, uh, you know, coding the performance into the abstraction layer, and using the utility only as needed, right? So let's take a look inside of Node. Um, there are actually a lot of ways that we can extend Node and uh, in, like plugins and widgets. And uh, later on today, Pat Cavett and uh, Anthony Pipkin are, are doing a talk on taking an idea and building it up into uh, a full widget. And uh, I really encourage you to check that, that talk out. It'll be a fantastic exploration of some of the higher level abstractions that we provide and some of the, the higher level um, infrastructure pieces and using those infrastructure pieces. So check that out. But what I'm going to talk about here are some of the lower level, uh, lower level hooks that are afforded to you in, the lang uh, in, um, in YUI for enhancing this abstraction layer. So I'll talk about attributes, methods, and events. Custom attributes um, are actually incredibly easy to add to, to Node. Uh, if, you are, if you are a module author, you've worked with base or attribute or widget, you're familiar with the ATTRS collection. This is that magic bag that says, when I try to get this particular property, it has some behavior associated with it. And so an implementation of that might be outer HTML, right? So outer HTML isn't in all browsers, but maybe it, it's particularly handy for your use case. And this, is, this is incidentally an, an incomplete solution, and I'm really curious if anyone spots how it can be, uh, how it is incomplete. But um, all we have to do is define a new property on that ATTRS collection and give it some behavior associated with a getter or with a setter. And now we have some magic, um, yeah, we have some, uh, uh, we now have a new attribute that is consumable by, by any node, right? That, that behavior is now associated with any node as an attribute. Uh, you notice I packaged that up as a module, and I probably actually should have put gallery dash node dash outer HTML because why isn't that there already? It might be actually. It might already be there. Anyway, so <clears throat> the point is that anyone that then uses this module then has that functionality added onto Node. All of the nodes in their system. Adding custom methods, right? So I'm going to talk about a method, uh, the the add method method, which is a static method method. Um, no, it's actually a prototype method method, but add method is a static method. So now that that makes sense, uh, the reason that I'm not enhancing the node prototype directly uh, <clears throat> will be discussed in a couple of slides. I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's uh, add a method onto the node prototype called common ancestor. And uh, the function that is passed into common ancestor the first parameter is always going to be the raw DOM element, right? This is close to the metal. This is at the abstraction layer, so we're working with the raw DOM element uh, that this node represents. And you add some functionality in here. This defines the functionality in there, and then you return something, right? And now anybody that packaged that up, anybody, anybody that uses that module, now we can have both common ancestor and get outer HTML, right? module system, you can build up the specific functionality that's applicable to your implementation. So what they have in common, and the reason that we're going through add method instead of going just straight prototype, is that these two mechanisms are built to preserve the abstraction layer. And the means that they do that, or, or how they do that, is through this method called scrubval. 
And <laughs> scrub valve looks like this, but let me explain it a different way. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what it does is it guarantees the abstraction layer by making sure that it's not returning a DOM node or returning a collection of, of DOM elements, right? So <clears throat> it makes sure that it's returning a node instance or it's returning a node list instance or it's returning, if you don't provide a return value, for example, it just makes it chainable. Um, if you return null from your method, then we honor that as a null return value. The, but the moral here is that we don't, it, it, using the add method or using the get, uh, the ATTRS collection for attributes, the mechanisms that then <clears throat> are in place for those attributes and those methods are built to preserve that, that abstraction layer. So the methods that you build, uh, the methods that you add on with add method, the attributes that you add on with the ATTRS collection, they look and behave exactly like the stuff, everything else across the, the node interface, right? So seamlessness and uh, consistency is important. So I'm going to take a little bit of a aside. Um, <clears throat> I'm kind of running low on time here, but this is a bit of an aside. Your part in preserving the abstraction, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with uh, y.config.doc and y.config.win. If you aren't, this is what you should be using instead of window and document. If you're writing module code, use these. Don't use window and document. The reason for doing that, two reasons, I'll give you an example. Um, one is that YUI instances, so that Y object, right, is going to be bound to a window and document. Well, it's not necessarily the parent window and document. It could be an iframe, right? It could be some other object somewhere. It could be some, you know, some other window somewhere else. Um, or you could be running in Node, or you could be running in, in YQL in an execute statement, right? Where there isn't a global window, there isn't a global document to reference. But if you are in those environments, then we have the plumbing in place to populate these variables and reference a facsimile of document, a facsimile, uh, a facsimile of window to whatever level of functionality that there is. But you can reference these safely. And then, like magic, your code now works in Node, just like that. So be mindful of window and document. Just use these. And uh, there's some benefits there. So back to what I was saying, on to events. Uh, yay me. Look, um, so last year, I talked about events. And I want to continue on to that. There was a point in the end of that discussion where I was talking about um, uh, adding new DOM, uh, new DOM events. And Nate touched on this a little bit yesterday as well. But uh, I was a little unhappy with the system as it was. The plumbing was in place, but there wasn't actually a convenient API. And there was, some, there was a higher level of requirement that the, uh, the implementer make sure that things are cleaned up properly and it has you know, life cycle maintenance for events and that sort of stuff. And so what we did uh, after that, shortly thereafter, is we built in the API for that. And so um, as Nate was showing actually yesterday, the API is y.event.define, right? So I'm going to define, say, a YUI conf event. And in the, the object that, that, that describes this event, I have a few properties to populate with functions, right? So in the, the on function defines the, the mechanism that happens when someone subscribes to it with on. And so this is where you set up the conditions for um, the conditions to monitor that would then satisfy the firing of this event. You can actually think about this as sort of redefining what's going on in the DOM, right? So the DOM code itself is just code that listens for conditions saying of the mouse, you know, the, the button on the mouse was depressed and it was released. Now I'm going to notify everyone to send out a, a dispatch, a click event, right? So this is your version of what's going on in there. You get to define what it means to have a YUI conf event. So in this case, it's just checking for the uh, YUI, the string YUI conf being a string. But now the, uh, some of the other properties in there, so detaching, uh, detaching events is also incredibly important, and there are a tremendous number of ways, incidentally, to detach events in, in YUI 3. It's, it's kind of astounding. But um, this gives you the hook for, for completing that life cycle and actually being um, uh, representing that event uh, 
in, in a more complete way. And, and actually, speaking of uh, completeness, now let's support delegation for those events. Now, it's not, uh, when you're talking about a system where this event could mean anything, it could be based on the, any criteria whatsoever to define this thing. Um, <clears throat> what it means to actually have that event bubble or what it means to actually satisfy a delegation of that event could actually be something different or could be described maybe in a more optimal way. And so uh, now in YUA3, there is the capacity to say when someone wants to delegate this synthetic event, um, this is the setup that is necessary for that and instead of the criteria in there. And before we get into the summary, I just want to show that because I actually coded that up yesterday and that was, that was a bit of fun. So, um, yeah, so we have the event calendar and um, let's see. Uh, no fun here, no sleep, and then today is, you know, why you wake up? Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, bitchin'. Yeah, ah, well, I, that didn't work. Anyway, so um, back to. Back to this, just to summarize, uh, modules of the future, but <clears throat> um, you, can either co you can either wait for the future or you can use an implementation of what will be the future, which has actually been there for a couple of years now, right? So YUI3, a little over a year, I guess I'm, I'm counting the time when we were fighting with each other in the conference rooms over how to implement stuff. Um, and the DOM is a mess, uh, surprisingly, again. And again, we can't forecast when it will be a mess again afterwards, right? So we need the, those abstractions. So what it comes down to is that inadequate systems, when, dealt with an, when you provide an abstraction layer over that inadequate system, not only does it fix that inadequate system, but it also provides you a tremendous amount of opportunity to then extend and really customize the environment that you're coding against. And YUI3 is really based on those core principles, that we start with abstracting an, an inadequate system, but then make that abstraction highly configurable and highly extensible so that we get to not only make a lot of great things happen for free, but we also extend a lot of capacity for you to make that environment even more awesome and then hopefully contribute that back in some sort of gallery module or whatnot, right? So we can all develop this this future together today, right? So look, it says the future is now. That's pretty cool. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. So thank you very much.